So in the prior video, we learned about functions and how we can implement functions, C-like functions or Java-like functions using argument, um, using um, arguments passed through or placed in the A registers and then values that would be returned through the V0, V1 register. So now, what if we want to work with more registers than just simply A0, A1, A2, and A3? And if we want to um, use some of the other um, registers that are there that are part of MIPS, some of the other general purpose registers, right? Some of the other 32 registers. So um, recall that the stack pointer is a register that holds the address of a place in memory that is higher up than your standard uh, data uh, storage area. So typically in the data storage that we've been working with, with a dot data segment, we're down here. Um, and where it says stack data, and then text is going to be the executable code. So we're going to look at this area here where you're seeing um, the stack, which as you place things on top of it, it grows downward, and then dynamic data as you request additional resources through like Java's new statement, as in ArrayList equals ArrayList, maybe team equals new ArrayList. So when you create objects, you're using um, this area over here, what we're calling dynamic data, often called a heap. Um, those two grow and shrink as necessary. So you may allocate or request memory for certain objects and then release it, request it and then release it. You're not constantly um, holding on, typically, to, to objects. And then when it comes to stacks, that's um, connected intimately to a function call. Every time you do a function call, the stack continues to grow. We push, uh, we continue to push things onto the stack. So when, as you're pushing, this is an upside down stack where it's growing downward. So when we are ready to save information in the function, in using, in, in doing this, um, in this model. We're going to save this information from within the function that's been called, right? Right after we've placed the label in there, we're going to jump to that label, and that's the start of a function call. And we'll push something onto memory. And then we'll push another value into memory. We'll push another value into memory. We'll push and so forth. Each time we do this, this stack will continue to grow downwards. What's going to help us keep track of this will be the stack pointer. And that stack pointer is going to be decremented to place in. Typically, it's going to be a word, so it's going to be four bytes. Then when we're ready to push more information on, we do another decrement. It's four bytes. When we're ready to push another word, we decrement. It's another four bytes. So our memory is allocated such that function calls will be uh, handled through the stack. Dynamic allocation is going to be handled through the heap, so through a malloc or through the new operator in Java, something like that. And then if you have variables, they'll be handled here in this area of memory. Uh, they'll be stored there. And if you have code, when you have code, it'll be stored there. And then there's an area here that's going to be reserved um, for primary functions of the, um, the CPU. So, we're, again, we're going to push our general purpose registers, and that's what GPRs, right here, that's what that's identifying, and that means the registers typically are those that are 0 through 31, right, those 32 registers. Now, whenever we do a push, as a reminder, if you've seen some of this in 
in uh, the data structures and algorithms course. Whenever you do a push, that value goes onto the stack. When you do another push, it goes on. When you do another push, you push that value on, um, and so forth. Now, push takes an argument, and that argument is the value that would be stored on there. And then if the next line of code is a pop, it will return a value, and the pop does not take an argument. What it will return would be the first value on the stack. And so the stack then, which had the 3, negative 1, 2, has removed the 8, so it looks like that. And after you do another pop, again, there's no argument there. What comes off and what's returned will be a 2, so that your stack now looks like this. So um, basically every push grows the stack, and every, um, every push grows the stack, and then every pop releases an element an object from the top of the stack. But again, our memory has the model of the stack so that it starts here. And every time we do a push, it's pushing onto a stack that grows in this fashion. And so if, for example, this address at the top is, let's go with negative 32, 28, 24, 20, and negative 16. Take away 4, and we're at 12. Every time you do a push, um, we're going to end up placing in a value. So let's say that it's... Um, 538. Then when you do another push, it goes here to 7, and let's just choose random numbers. Then when you do another push, it goes here, um, 655. So what that means is that the stack pointer might initially be at negative 32. And then that's where the value gets pushed in to that address. Then the stack pointer is pointing at negative 28. So you put the value in there, and then you decrement it. So now it's, the next value is going to be placed over here. So you're modifying this value that's in the stack pointer. Um, and since we're putting into the stack register values, and each one of those takes up four bytes, we're decrementing it by four. And we're going to get those values into that area of memory by using a store word, whichever register it is, um, those contents that we wish to place into memory and then we're going to place them into the place indicated by the stack pointer um, and if that value let's say that we're initially at some particular point we're placing a value in um, then the next address that we'd want to store would be 4 beneath that. So each one of those is modeling a separate push. So there are two ways of doing it. We can either modify the value of the stack pointer and decrement it by 4, keeping this to be a 0, or we can modify um, what's added to the stack. So we'll say a little bit more about that. But the basic idea is we want to be able to change the address at which values are getting stored into the stack. And that address will change by 4. Um, and so for each push, there's going to have to be space available uh, where, it's to where we would push that. So here's one way of modeling this. Like, let's say we're doing two pushes. Right? And we have our stack. And he's initially pointing to some space in memory. 36, 32, 28, 24, and 20.
So he's initially pointing to some space in memory. So in order to do a push, if I want to push the return address register, the RA register onto the stack, what I'll do is decrement SP by four, and then I'll go ahead and store the contents of that register into memory. So it will store that 32-bit value into memory. Then when I'm ready to do another push, I'll decrement the stack pointer by four. So now it's pointing to this space in memory. And then I'll go ahead and store the contents of this other particular value, this other register. So that's how we would model. That's one way we could model a push into um, a, a push onto our stack. Notice that we, in, in our code, if we're pushing two separate values onto the stack, what I could have done was this. So let's give ourselves the same scenario. negative 32, negative 28. So realizing that I have to push two different items onto the stack, what I could have done was just simply subtracted 12. Let's do an add i, stack pointer, stack pointer, um, neg not 12, but 8. Since I have two values, I'm going to use an 8. So that takes it from where it was to down here. And that opens up two spaces. So once I've done that, now I can go ahead and use code that will do the two pushes. So the two pushes at that point would look like this. There's a store word and I would want to put register RA in to the value at wherever the current stack pointer is. And then I'd also want to do a store word for the next register, let's say S0, into plus four, which will put it into this space here, where based on well, the current stack pointer. So these three lines of code can replace these four lines of code. And of course, the more pushes you do, the more efficient your code would be. If I, right, so with, um, I only had two pushes. And with those two pushes, I ended up with three lines of code. So number of pushes, number of lines of code. So with two pushes, I had um, three lines of code. With three pushes, once again, I'd have the add i and then three store words. So I'd have an add i and then I'd have three lines of code, so for a total of four lines. With four pushes, I'd have a different add i, and then I'd have to push four different items. I'd have that, so for a total of five lines of code. And then finally, if I had to push five different items, I'd have six lines of code. So with five items, I'd have six lines of code if I do it in this way here. And that's versus five times two, um, 10 lines of code. So it is quite a bit more efficient.
So for this example here, let's say that I have chosen to protect um, at least three registers. Those three registers would be S0, T0, T1, because I'm going to use them here. And I don't know who called me. And at least I don't know what registers he's using, but I know that, let's say down here, I'm going to use these registers, S0, T0, T1, and I need to protect them. So I'm going to need um, space on my stack, right? So since I have three, it's going to be three times four or 12 bytes. So I'll need to do something in the way of an add i that creates the space for my pushes to occur, 12 bytes. So I'm going to have to drop this to 12 bytes. And then I'm going to do a store word, store word, store word. And in that store word, I will go ahead and save S0, T0, and T1. So that's my stack here. S0, T0, and T1. And so what I can do is, let's say that I first push onto the stack T1, T0, and S0. And then this is going to be stored based on an offset from the stack pointer. And then T1 is where the stack pointer is. And then this moves the stack pointer up. Well, moves it to the next spot. So remember, this is an upside down stack. So you're adding four to a negative value. And then this will take it to the next position. So this here takes care of incrementing or um, pushing this four different values onto the stack. And then our code is going to do whatever it's going to do, which is pretty simple here. And then we're going to have to undo here and restore the values in those registers to their values that they were when we came into this function called leaf. Let's put a label here, leaf example. Label. So how do I push, so right now, store word is taking those values and moving them in this direction. And it pushes them into memory. And then when I'm done, what I want to do is use a load word and then restore the stack pointer with an add i at the end and place it back to where it was initially. And with that load word, I'm going to undo S0, T0, T1. And these will have to correspond. So what I pushed into the stack pointer at a certain position, I'm going to retrieve from the stack pointer um, from that same sp uh, spot in memory. And then I've restored it back. So this is kind of what happens prior to. And since, well, this actually happens prior to, so we're calling this the prologue. So let's call that the prologue. And then this is what happens after the story is over the epilogue. And then everything else, um, let's do this. Everything else that happens here is gonna correspond to the function of the code. So the prologue and epilogue are mirrors of one another for the most part, but that's the thinking that goes behind those two components. So this is what it looks like. We have the epilogue and the prologue. Um, the code itself happens here where 
we add A0 and A1, which are G and H. We add A2 and A3, which are I and J. And then I want to subtract T0 and T1. So T0 minus T1 happens here. And then it's stored inside of S0, but in order to return the value, we place the answer typically inside of V0. So the call, the, func the code that called this function is looking for the answer to be inside of V0. Um, that's the convention. Call that arguments are there. V0 typically are the values for function results. So those are the basics of, uh, of how you can implement a function. You can see that there's a, there's a cost to calling a function versus code replacement or a macro. When a function is called, there are additional steps that take place. There are additional processor um, execution um, or instructions that are run for that function to work. And it's also a requirement of additional memory. So functions do incur some cost when you call a function versus expanding code via macros. Um, so that's, that's one of the, maybe that is the most important thing to learn at this point is that there is, it's not without penalty that we make our, that we do function calls. There's a memory penalty and there's an execution or processor um, cost. Now, take a look at uh, this problem, and, and you'll see that it ties into the previous discussion where this is a quiz problem where I said there's one way to do to, uh, a push and then another push, right? Or you can do it this way here. And then had you, I was asking that you think about what's placed at the top of the stack. Um, and so thinking about the stack as being you know there's a push and then another push the push what's at the top is the last element that was pushed onto the stack the last element that was pushed onto the stack so s0 and again our stack is upside down and it grows from this way so the last element in memory is this also there was an earlier discussion about you know, if you're pushing eight registers, how many instructions are needed? Well, there's one for the add i to the stack pointer. And then there's going to be, um, it's going to be eight, right? We're pushing eight registers. So there's going to be eight store words that are needed. So for a total of nine. If you use method two, then it's going to be a push, a push. Each one of those requires two instructions. So eight times two instructions per push with eight pushes ends up being 16 instructions. And so finally, if you have a function such as this, which is a non-leaf, meaning it's not just a function that does something, it's a function that calls another function. We also have to re um, save the value that's inside of RA because jump and link will go ahead and place a value into RA. So when we do a jump and link to get here, RA has a value, but in order to get to molt, there's going to be another jump in link, which means the previous RA established in the first call is going to be overwritten. So in our function, we should also make sure we do a push on the RA register. So you'll see for something like this, um, where we're implementing a function that is a non-leaf that calls another function, we save the return address, but then we also save other values that um, that we wish to use 
within our function. So in this case, you'll see that RA is saved. We go ahead and do another jump and link to MULT, finish the calculation, save the result. Right, so the result gets saved, and then we can restore the RA so that we can successfully come out of this. And therefore, we could do recursive functions as well by making sure we save and push onto the stack the RA register as well. So at this point, we've completed in the other modules um, a discussion on syscalls, macros, which are, are they're an alternative to functions, which make your code appear to be concise, but it really takes what's maybe one or two, maybe one line of code, but it expands it. It's actually multiple lines of code that are represented by maybe one line. Makes it easier to analyze, look at, think about, but it also um, prevents us from incurring the penalty that comes with function calls. So macros have a place. And then we talked about some of the function um, conventions, function calling conventions. And then more importantly, how a stack is used in those conventions.